How's that, Alex? Is that music coming through? Yes. Yeah. And uh, is is that how's that in comparison to my voice? Is it is it? It's okay. Like, distracting. If... No, no, no. It's fine. Because I was thinking about having it running while I was talking. The, the only is, uh, uh, if this music is free to use, so we won't be uh, banned on YouTube. Ah, gotcha. Of course. Well, it's it's from YouTube, and it's three hours of relaxing guitar music, instrumental. <laughs> so I'd say they've mixed together a whole bunch. Right, because you know when you showed your trailer of Ika Boomers, so it, uh, it was a claim to our channel because of it. It was what? Uh, Ika Boomers uh, yeah. has sent a uh, claim. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, to the stream. Because of this trailer. Yeah, right. Well, that's always fun. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's not it's hilarious. Not, uh, it's not a big, uh, you know, claim. So it's fine. It's just monetization issue. And we don't fall. We don't pursue it. So it's fine. Gotcha. Gotcha. <clears throat> So if anyone's tuning into the live stream, we're just going to begin in about five minutes. It's giving people a bit of opportunity to jump on, tune in. So if you're uh, if you're on BitCloud, then share it out amongst the community. Would be great. If you're uh, on other social medias, Facebook, Twitter, any of that, then feel free to send it out there, the live link to YouTube, so they can tune in and we can get the word out about about the new platform and what we're doing on here. The post about your lecture is going global now. Hey, <laughs> you gave me a chuckle, Alex. That was <laughs> classic. Nice. Welcome, Zopel. All right. We'll just give another minute or two for everyone to turn up, tune into the live stream, get the word out. Apparently they've gone global on BitCloud, which is great. And then we can start the storytelling and have a bit of fun. And for those that are tuning in, it's going to be a great little hour. I'll be storytelling a bit about you know the vision I see for BitCloud and where it's heading. And then after that, we've uh, got some special guests on to to look into um, some of the happenings, the fiery, passionate happenings that have been happening around the place. There'll be a great discussion happening then. So make sure to stick around when we're finished. Alex, did you want to stop uh, five minutes before and, and reset the stream or are we just going to keep going through with this one? 
I think we can go. I think we don't need to stop. Just we roll will, through. We will cut in future and we will change the video if we need it. Yeah, great. And you, I'll hand it to you when I'm done and you'll introduce and take care of Hunter and... No, I here. think you, you, yeah. you can start by yourself. Yeah, go straight in. See, I can give you organ organizer, right? So, if you want. To tune, to tune this video on you. What, what? Yeah, sweet. All right, we'll, uh, so you we'll can... get it cranking and I'll bring them in. Beautiful. Oh, we got to make sure you have the co-host. All right, there you go, Alex. If you if you if you will have some uh, screen sharing or something like this, so you can do it yourself. Yeah, I decided to keep it simple for this round. Okay. All right. Well, I tell you what, I reckon it's a good time to start. Yep. What do you think? Yeah, great. All right. Let's do it. So. All right. So welcome everybody to um, to this little lecture talk, exploration, and more than anything, storytelling session on you know how BitCloud holds the potential to really make a big movement in liberating human experience. And so we're going to explore that topic over the next uh, forty-five minutes or so, and just kind of drop in. And I just wanted to pre kind of preface with everything that I share in the next hour or so that nothing that I say do I claim as truth or, or definite, but rather it's the imagine imaginationings, which is a new word I'm going to use right now. You know, it's, it's a storytelling to explore what's possible to help keep our imaginations alive so that as we move forwards, we, we can respond with creativity and try and avoid getting stuck in the old traps. And we're going to touch on a little bit of that. And I consider myself more a storyteller than anything else these days. So, um, yeah, big shout out. Thank you, Alex from Cloud Forum, who um, Alex Roken, Roken, who is, uh, has helped anchor and, and get this whole Cloud Forum up and running. It's been fantastic. We've had some great people, great talks. Um, big shout out to um, Rome, uh, Bra Moments, Zopal for joining us live here and everyone who's tuning in on the live stream. So first and foremost, before we go deep into BitCloud, I really wanted to talk about this idea of lim liberating human experience. And, and what do I mean by that when I put that in the title? Because it's a, it's a pretty big claim, a pretty bold claim, you know, liberating human experience. But it's something that I myself, so my name's Mark Bentley and I have a business called Live Your Genius. And so for the last 10 years, I've been, you know, my work has revolved around really exploring how can we unlock a deeper sense of purpose in the everyday person? Because I feel that one of the biggest issues we're facing in the world right now that is leading to anxiety at rates we've never seen before, depression, all these kinds of mental instabilities in the world, you know, one of the main causes of this from my perspective is a lack of authentic purpose. And so I wanted to flesh that out a little bit before I go into how BitCloud actually can take that and, and bring some solutions to this problem. So to start this story, we'll go back to the old days, like going back hundreds of years before the, te uh, the, before the Industrial Revolution, before technology really played such a big part in our society. So throw your mind back now to, you know, those tribal days where we were all in villages, whether it was, you know, in Europe or, or Africa or, or wherever it was, you know, we, we had a much more tribal lifestyle where people actually had survival challenges, very real survival challenges. If they didn't get food that day, they didn't have fridges to store anything. They didn't have all these, you know, technologies that enabled this kind of almost laziness that we can see in our, in our lifestyles now. So back in those days, purpose was derived from a need to survive. And it was a genuine purpose because it was a genuine survival need in that sense. So back in the old days, if you were the, the baker, 
you know, you had to bake. If you were the gardener, the farmer, you had to farm. You had to go out in the morning. You had to tend to the farm, to the to the plants, etc. Or if it was even before then, you just had to go hunt for days to find meat or, or vegetables to bring back to the village. And whatever your role was, you didn't really have a choice. You know, if you were born into the blacksmith family, you'd become a blacksmith. And people would really find a genuine satisfaction in that, not necessarily because they were genetically predisposed to being a blacksmith, but because they had a deep sense of purpose, because that village needed the blacksmith. They needed somebody there. It was, it was a survival need that was being filled, which meant that that person had a deep sense of service into their community. So whether it was what they wanted to do or not, they were able to fulfill that sense of purpose. Now, as we've gone on in time, this authentic purpose has begun to change a little bit. When the Industrial Revolution came in, all of a sudden we had these massive advancements, you know, with the steam engines and technology and machines. And, and when that began, then we started actually shifting the way we did things because post-war, post all this Industrial Revolution and coming to our day today, we have all the technology to take care of most jobs. You know, technically we could be putting automation in place in so many areas. And what's really interesting is one of the biggest fears is, well, there'll be no jobs as if that's a problem. You know, what about the unemployment? What about this? What about that? As if that's an, an ex existential threat. And so this, so what, what's happened is our society has been creating synthetic jobs, synthetic purpose. It's, it's using this industrial revolution and then it's creating jobs that actually aren't even needed just so that people can actually have a way to earn some income as a way of distributing income. So we've kind of moved forwards into this world where, you know, we don't actually have to go out and tend to a farm or we don't have to go out and tend to, because there's a million other farms, there's a million other factories, there's a million other things where we can get support. You know, those of us fortunate living in some Western countries that have government support, it's gotten even easier to the point that you don't actually have to do anything and you can still survive. So what's happened is that genuine survival pressure that gave us purpose in the old days has gone. You know, and so most, uh, so many of us have been going to jobs, you know, going out there in the world and doing a job knowing deep inside that yeah, this, this job is not that necessary. You know, there's something bigger I could be doing. There's a bigger calling I could be offering to the world. And so the big restrictions that I'm seeing happening here is that this old kind of way of looking at the world, the old way of looking at economics, politics, etc., is still anchored in this survival mindset, right? So to keep our economic uh, model moving, we need inflation, and, and talking about the traditional economic model, not the decentralized blockchain, the new economic model that's being born, we're going to move into that one. But the old economic model, you know, it's based on survival, and the way that they distribute income is essentially through a form of economic slavery, right? And, and what I mean by that is, you know, it's not because it's not about, you know, how much money there is in the world because people print money, destroy money. Money in the old system is a manipulated thing. It, it's, it can be increased. It can be decreased. So it's not that there's a limit of money. The issue we have is the distribution of that money, the distribution of those resources out there into the world. And so the way that we have developed over these years to, to find you know, the best way to distribute that income into the world has been through you know, this idea of employment, of jobs, right? Of going to a job and working nine to five, you know, eight to four, whatever your, your time schedules are and what country you are, because I was very different everywhere. And so what, what we've basically done is taken the human intrinsic value, we've taken humans and we've put them into the machine. If you look at schools, for example, primary schools, high schools, all of these things, they're a byproduct of the industrial revolution. The schooling system has essentially evolved as a solution to, well, while we've got adults needing to run these machines, who's going to look after the kids? Well, let's create schools. Let's create places we can put them all together. 
And then those schools were then deeply influenced and they still are today by industry. You know, the, my, my son's um, principal at, at, at the primary school he goes to, he said this himself. He was, you know, saying, look, Mark, we, we, we do the best we can to give the kids what we think they need. But at the same time, half of the school curriculum, you know, is, is consulted on and, and organized by industry. And so what happens is industry comes in and says, this is what we want from education so that we can fit those little humans in your school into our machines when they become big humans. And so the focus of education has not been around who are you as a human? What is your potential? What is the potential of our humanity and how can we expand it? And how can we help you to find that spark inside you, set it alight so you can be truly of service with your genius in the world? Instead, schooling systems have evolved to basically see what does our society need in the machine and how can we mold those creative geniuses that are so innocent in their exploration of life when they're young and how can we box them up and squeeze them into this form that's going to fit into the machine without causing problems you know and that's why anyone who is a creative thinker a rebel in a sense often ends up kicked out of that box often ends up struggling and and more than often ends up in trouble ends up you know running around on the streets because not because they are a bad person but because they couldn't find a home, they couldn't find a place where they could be recognized and seen and where their fire, their purpose, which was more than just being furniture in the machine, wasn't able to be expressed and, and accepted. So we, we see this kind of movement that's happened in our society and we've been getting to this point where it's becoming harder and harder. You know, did the interview with Seth Savoy the other day, if, if you haven't seen it, then check out the YouTube channel for Cloud Forum. We've got all the replays on there. And, you know, Seth, he, he's created this movie called Echo Boomers, which was a, about this, this disgruntlement, this, this anger, this, this bitterness that is in a lot of the youth right now because they've gone through that system. They've gone through that schooling. They've gone through all that conditioning of like, do this, do that, do that. And you're going to have a 200 grand loan for the privilege of being able to go to school to be told what to do and then go into the workforce. And then they're going into the workforce and the work's not there. And more and more, as we move forwards into this new world of blockchain, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, technology, et cetera, more and more of those jobs are going to disappear. And we're going to see an absolute need to shift the way that we're doing economics and, po and politics. Because if we continue the way we are now, then we are essentially going straight for a cliff, just like the Roman empires did and just like every other empire before us. Sooner or later, we get to a point where centralized power becomes too consolidated that it actually strangles itself. And we've seen that collapse again and again and we can see the signs of that in our world right now. We can see those similar signs of things coming together where if we were not ready for this, we would have some dire straits. And we are still going to have some challenges. Don't get me wrong. I'm a great optimist, but I'm learning to become a, a realist as well. And so as we move forwards now, we need to respond as a creative humanity to this problem, to this challenge that we have in new ways. And so that brings me to this idea of BitCloud, you know, which is what unifies all of us here on this platform. If you're watching this from outside of BitCloud, you know, it does look a little bit cultish sometimes to people because they're seeing people come together because the, and, and celebrating, being happy, being passionate, you know, you know, doing crazy things like getting this, you know, symbol tattooed on their arm. And the reason that we're doing this is not because of some centralized God. It's not because of someone we are worshiping. But it's because this symbol, which is the symbol for BitCloud, represents not a company, not a business, but it represents a vision that actually is so much bigger than I think many people actually appreciate. And so talking about that, if you think of BitCloud, right, BitCloud.com, most people, and, and I'm sure a lot of people on the platform and definitely anyone outside of the platform, if I was to say to somebody, you know, look, I've got the BitCloud tattoo on my arm, they're going to look at me like I'm batshit crazy thinking, why did you go get a company 
company's logo on your arm. Like to them, it might sound like, you know, getting Facebook logo or, or tele, you know, Instagram or, you know, one of these logos, right? And that would be, you know, if you knew me well, you would know that is the most insane thing I'd ever considered doing. And what we, I, I'm a very passionate about getting across and, and I think is one of the biggest game changers for people that get involved in BitCloud is when you begin to realize that BitCloud is not the platform on the surface. BitCloud.com, where most people think is BitCloud, or even the apps that are out there, the Flick app, the Cloud Feed, all these different apps, you know, people think, oh, that's BitCloud. You know, that feed is BitCloud. It's like, no, that's just a concept, a proof of concept, a, a demonstration of one way that, that BitCloud can be used. So to understand this better, think of BitCloud as, because BitCloud is a blockchain. And a blockchain is a series of a network of ledgers, so computers that are running these ledgers all over the world and are constantly updating each other, keeping a synchronized database of all the information that gets put onto the blockchain, onto the BitCloud blockchain. And so that is a decentralized network that contains all of the information we are sharing. So when you make a post, when you, when you, um, send someone some coin or someone invests in your coin or whatever is it that goes on the platform, all of that is being recorded on the BitCloud blockchain. So the BitCloud blockchain is like a big database. So imagine that there's the surface and underneath the surface is the mechanics of BitCloud, is this big, incredible blockchain of decentralized computer systems, et cetera, working together to weave the information so that if one computer goes down, it continues. You know, you can knock out lots of computers and it will continue to survive eternally until the power shuts out in that sense. And so that's what I this represents to me is the actual blockchain underneath it, which is actually empowering us with technology to be able to communicate and not communicate freely of censorship and control from centralized authorities or people who have differing opinions of us so that we can continue our open conversations and discussions so that there will always be a place for us, you know, to be able to communicate and get in touch in different ways. Now, we then look on the surface and this is where it gets interesting. This is where it gets beautiful is the, the actual BitCloud blockchain itself cannot be censored, right? You know, it cannot be controlled. It's this wild, beautiful thing. It, the only way it can be changed, all the developers came together and everyone agreed to make a move, just like with Bitcoin, et cetera. It's a massive undertaking, but it is possible only if there's that big consensus. A lot of people then respond to that and think, well, hang on a second. If there's no censorship, if there's no things, you know, that's going to get nasty on there, right? Because you're going to get horrible things. You know, people might be putting on, you know, highly illegal activity that is very immoral. And, and you know, I don't even want to mention the words of, of what's going on there, but I'm sure you, you, everyone's all well aware of what can happen when you let, you know, everything off the chain. And so this is where the next layer comes into place is BitCloud is open source and decentralized. So what it means is that anyone can go and create their own bitcloud.com. So anyone can go on and we could do cloudforum.org or cloudforum.com and that could be a gateway and we could design our own uh feed. We could design our own mechanics. We could design however we want that data from the blockchain to be expressed. And so what that means is if bitcloud.com, who, by the way, big shout out to Diamond Hands, May Beam and the whole developer team, plus big shout out to the extended developer team that's grown from the community and he's putting so much love into building this um, amazing new environment. But this, this old, uh, sorry, this bitcloud.com that they've built, at, it was built as a concept to prove what you could do with the blockchain, with the bitcloud blockchain, so that all of us, could come in and reimagine what's possible and begin to build it ourselves. So this is where BitCloud does not belong to Diamond Hands. It does not belong to any of these developers, but rather it's a community, it belongs to itself. It's wild. It has been set free into the ocean and it is something that, you know, really does have its own life. And we're more gardeners tending 
to these seedlings that are growing out of BitCloud. And so they've designed it so that bitcloud.com is an example of what you can do. And they're constantly improving that in so many ways. But if you ever feel that the way things are being done on bitcloud.com do not align with your values, or you think they're doing too much censorship, because the nodes can censor, the nodes can put in algorithms and change things of who gets to be shown and what gets done, etc. And if you feel that's unfair, what's happening, if you feel that, you know, it's it's censoring too much and it's, it's, it's not allowing free speech or, or whatever your passion is, then all you need to do is go find other people who share your values, find other people who share your vision, come together, find some developers and then build a new node. And you can build a node exactly how you want it. You can build it how your community needs it. So maybe you have a community that's focused on you know, uh, psychedelics, for example, psychedelics and the research of psychedelics for the mental well-being of humans right now. Very touchy topic, something that could very easily get censored out there. Maybe you've got a community that just loves to discuss this, wants to speak freely about their experiences about this. Well, you could start, you know, a, you know, bitcloudpsychedelics.com, create a node and a place and set the algorithms so that you know those who you know are into psychedelics, any any words, any hashtags, anything that is related to that topic gets prioritized. Maybe you have uh, BitCloud psychedelics coin, and anyone who owns just a little bit of that that coin can use that uh, portal and can be displayed on there more prominently than every other user on BitCloud, and that will only be on that node. Right, So that's the beauty of these nodes. So we've got the BitCloud chain underneath, and then we've got all these individual entities that are growing on top that are actually just self-organizing. Anyone can use the BitCloud, BitCloud blockchain. And so what this means is we've got a new system that allows for self-organization, right? And this is a really important thing for liberating the human experience. Because with this self-organization, what we begin to see grow and succeed and thrive on BitCloud is the things that the community wants. It's the thing that we are voting for with our clout, right? Clout means influence. So when we say BitCloud, it's bit influence, right? And people don't like this word influencer, but the fact is we're all influencers. Every single person on this planet is influencing their environment just by simply being alive. Every time you take a breath, you are influencing more carbon dioxide into your environment and taking oxygen. Every time you are going to a shopping center, you know, someone might just see you. you know, your presence has influenced that environment for bit better or worse, for bigger or smaller things. We are influencing each other all the time. And we now need to become responsible for this influence. We now need to actually step up and be accountable for our influence and actually use our influence for the things that we believe in. Because what we're seeing now in this, you know, we've got this beautiful decentralized world, but I'm going to take a little moment where we're going to throw back to traditional social media and how influence worked there. So just to give a bit of contrast to, to where we're going, so if you think about the old social medias, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, I mean, they're like the three top ones, right? And then there's all these others that go around it. They're all different styles of essentially the same thing. People sharing information together in networks. So BitCloud can be all of those things, depending on how you design your, your plugins, your nodes, all those different things that go on top. But looking back to these old social medias, they're based on a centralized authority. So this is going to be a big concept here, centralized authority and decentralized authority. And to make sure this is fully understand, understood in what I'm putting forward here, let's take that word authority, right? Now, if you're anything like me, everyone probably heard that word and some muscles in their body just tightened up. I know for me, if you said authority around me, you know, the hair on the back of my neck stands up and it's like, uh-uh. You know, it's almost like this inbuilt rebel that's like, no, 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 no. No authority here. Like it, I, I, I was a borderline anarchist for many of my years. I was pursuing this idea of sovereignty because I couldn't handle the idea of the traditional social model because to me, 
It was incredibly disempowering and, and I could see the economic slavery at play. And so when we drop into this idea of authority, break it down and consider the word author. So author itty, right? Authority. So the word author is an authority. And so if we then break that down, what does authority mean? It essentially means who is authoring your experience? Who is authoring how you are experiencing life, right? So when we say someone has, you know, yes, he's an authority in the subject, it means he gets to author how people experience that subject, which means he has influence on how people interpret that subject, right? And so it then brings us to this idea of external authority and internal authority. So am I authoring how I experience life? Am I deciding? Am I writing the story for how I want to experience life? Or am I a victim and a slave to external authorities? You know, am I allowing my, my government to dictate how I experience my reality? Am I allowing my childhood, my traumas, my, my parents, you know, my schooling? Am I allowing those things to still dictate how I experience, experience my reality? And so this is a big step we need to take in humanity right now is to step up into a place where we can begin to claim our own authority again, to step up in, in power, because we cannot have freedom. We cannot have a decentralized world unless we are all standing in our own inner authority rather than being slaves to being told how we need to experience things. So there's going to be a, a, an adjustment as we go. You know, it's going, to, it's going to be a little bit of turbulence in discovering what that means. Now, so now we look at this idea of authority. Our old systems rely on external authorities to establish trust, right? So what that means is if you want to exchange money, then you need a centralized authority that both of us trust, at least superficially, in order to make a transaction. So we, we use um, any of the big banks, the Federal Reserve, et cetera. They're all these authorities, self-proclaimed authorities in some places that are you know kind of playing that middleman. And we're seeing this everywhere. So Facebook has a centralized authority. You know, you have Mark Zuckerberg and all of the people that come from him, you know, Twitter, you know, Instagram, all those ones, they all have their central authorities. Now, those central authorities are responsible for dictating and deciding how that environment of that platform works, right? So Mark Zuckerberg and his team, they, they are this centralized group that have to constantly be adapting and making decisions as to what is okay, what is not okay, you know, how do people monetize, who gets shown, all of these things that create the environment that people on Facebook create in and build in are decided by these centralized groups. Now, one of the big problems of centralized power is, yes, it was necessary before blockchain, that was just a way that we needed to do things. You know, it was an archaic kind of way that we needed to evolve. And we needed centralized because we, we weren't able to trust each other, you know, in these times. And so one of the problems is, as all of this power has been centralizing into these different places, whether it's YouTube, et cetera, it means that decisions are now much easier to influence. So Mark Zuckerberg is under a lot of pressure He's under pressure from stakeholders who have invested in Facebook that want him to do whatever it takes to make money and profits. He's under pressure from all of the community and, and the, the global kind of dogma of the way the world is being conditioned to see things. They're under, so, you know, they have to kind of pander to the loudest voices you know, with their regulations and rules, because otherwise those loud voices get in the way of their advertising revenue, gets in the way of the shareholders. And so the old thing you know, becomes a problem. And then on top of that, they've become so big, so much centralized power that the governments are now getting very involved with influencing what they can and can't do and how it's going to express itself. And to use the power of social media to forward their own propagandas so we're seeing government pushing propaganda. In fact, it's like World War III kind of happens underground with this kind of propaganda war. 
that happens all around the world, trying to get people to believe in a certain storyline. And so what we're seeing is these centralized places are becoming, you know, it creates a synthetic control of values. So synthetic meaning artificially man-made, right? So what we're seeing is that these centralized authorities are being put into a position where they have to create synthetic uh, values and, con and synthetic controls to ensure that people abide by them, right? Now, that is an incredible, in incredibly insane place to be. And I by no means would ever in any way possible would ever want to be Mark Zuckerberg. I would hate to be any of these characters that are at the center of power because when that much power gets put on, you know, they lose their own freedom in a sense. We think, oh, they could do whatever, but they can't. You know, whatever reaction they do, somebody is going to attack them. Somebody is going to hit them because they are a big, shining, centralized target of power that everyone wants to control. And what this does, because of all these regulations, because of all these rules, it begins to suffocate innovation. It creates bureaucracy. It creates the bureaucracy we see in governments where there's centralized power. Again, centralized power, everyone tries to influence it. You know, um, Everyone tries to control it. And from that, innovation is stifled. It, it is such a long-winded thing to get anything done, right? And so this then leads to part of what I feel is a, a very big problem in our world because we technically live in a safer time than we've ever had. We have more technology and more resources than we, we've ever wanted. Technically, as Buckminster Fuller said, um, I think it was back in the 80s, you know, he said way back before, you know, we have enough resources to feed the world. We don't have a problem with resources. We have a problem with the distribution of resources. And so... What we're seeing when we constantly centralize power all the time is that eventually, as we say, it stifles innovation and it begins to prioritize survival-based behaviors. So what I mean by this is, you know, if you look at the economics, how, how does marketing work? I mean, look at the mainstream of how marketing is being pushed. Create fear and then sell the solution. Create fear, then sell the solution, right? Right. You won't be pretty enough. You won't be strong enough. Do you need? Do you, you don't want to get sick, so get this medicine. You don't want that, so get this. It's a constant, subtle barrage of fear frequency that is pumping through the planet in order to maintain an inflationary eco economic system that is doomed eventually to failure. And so this fear is insidious throughout all of us. It's creating this intense stress, which in turn is, is stressing out the body. And when you stress out the body, it goes into fight and flight, which means we're much more reactive, where we heal much slower. The body heals much quicker when it's calm and relaxed. When it's in fight and flight, you know, your, your whole body goes into switching into survival mode, you know, it goes into that reptilian hindbrain and stops thinking clearly and logically and begins reacting, creates stress hormones and all these things because it thinks it needs to run away from a tiger. But the crazy part is that right now we're living in a world where the greatest tiger that we need to protect ourselves from is ourselves. That's what's really terrifying us, is our human behavior. It's gotten to a point where we don't have to worry about you know, not having enough food because all the technology is there, all the AI automation, everything's there. If we were able to work together, we would be able to provide you know, water in Africa, food in all these different places, you know, gardens that grow within beautiful little, you know, whatever greenhouses or how you want to build it. There's so much technology that most of us haven't even seen yet that's ready now. And so really what we're seeing here is that the old model is dying. Centralized power has come to the end and is rapidly going downwards in, into, into the mess, the chaos that we're witnessing. And the more that it begins to, to collapse, the more it begins to fight. And what we're seeing, and a big shout out to the early Bitcoin um, believers back in the day, because anyone who was part of the very early Bitcoin days knows how much you get ridiculed when you're starting up with something new. They know how much you know, crap that gets given, how many people will criticize endlessly and challenge it endlessly, but they won't actually think about it first. 
They want you to tell them everything and it becomes this hard work. And in some ways, BitClout is breaking new ground as well. Not in some ways, in massive ways, BitClout is breaking new ground as well. And we're going to have to face similar things. And, and it's good to be aware of that and not think that we need to just mainstream this straight away, but rather that this will take time. But what we're doing is bringing in, you know, this new system. And so what we're bringing in is decentralized authority. That's what Bitcoin, that's what blockchain, that's what all these different platforms are facilitating. DeFi, decentralized finance, et cetera. It's taking the middleman out. It's taking the centralized person out. And so the reason that it can do this is because of blockchain technology. Blockchain is what has kind of changed everything. So when we had the industrial revolution with the steam engine and, and you know working out how to use mechanical power, that began a rapid evolution of humanity and now we're getting to a point where we're being strangled by our own you know, innovation because we're, we're missing the next piece. And that's what blockchain is, to me anyway. Blockchain is the new revolution, the new evolution of what's to come because blockchain has enabled what we call trustless environments. So trustless environments. So what that means is an environment where we can do business together and we don't need to trust each other, right? This is something around blockchain that is really important to understand is, you know, people, you know, of course, the absolute ideal would be if we could trust each other, right? Like, of course, we, it would be the absolute most perfect situation if all of humanity sorted their shit out, pulled their, pulled their act together, took care of their emotional regulation, deeply embodied compassion and worked together authentically and we're able to deeply trust each other. But because of human behavior and the fact that as soon as fear kicks in, we go back into fight and flight patterns, which all often are triggered by trauma, et cetera, and not by faults of our own. They're old patterns that are just there from, from whatever's happened. We can't be trusted when that back part of our brain is in, in control, right? Because that part of the brain is all about survival. So, this is why blockchain is, a t is, is the next solution that is going to help us get there. It's going to help us get further forward to a place by creating an environment where we can start working together, creating together without actually needing to create these centralized authorities that we trust. Because I don't know about you, but I don't trust in any of the centralized authorities that we have in our world right now. And it's, it's, it's actually ter terribly sad. You know, I, I don't trust in the me medical institutions that are, you know, centralized, you know, and I want to, and I feel for it because there are so many amazing doctors, amazing people out there, amazing people working in the labs, creating amazing things. And I want to trust in them. But as long as it's running through the centralized authority that we have seen nothing but corruption from in government, politics, and all these different things, I can't trust it. And by nature, it makes it very hard to trust them because they're playing by the centralized authorities' rules, which I see are causing problems. So now we're moving into this decentralized world with blockchain. The blockchain is creating a place where we begin to see open source software coming in, open source technology, open source meaning that everyone has the right and access to the code to replicate and change and do their own form of something. So it means that we're no longer patenting, 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 and holding these, these ideas of ours to ourselves. But open source is about opening those ideas, sharing those ideas with each other so that we can just really, you know, organically innovate on top of them. And what that's doing is actually taking innovation and freeing it. It's allowing, you know, things to evolve rapidly. And we're seeing that on BitCloud right now in the platform. You know, if, you, if you've ever been in the, uh, the Nitro Average, then in the Nitro Average space, there's people coming all the time to be able to join together, work together and create amazing uh, new businesses, new platforms and, and innovate. So what this brings us towards is then, and if you, it's bringing efficient innovations to collective solutions and on top of that, it's creating an organic hierarchy of evolutionary values. So what we're seeing from blockchain is that we're all working together, butting up against each other, causing friction together. 
and then being able to work together because there is no one we can we, we can't run off to mummy and daddy like kids having a fight you know we can't you know complain to the police or the governments etc but rather we need to connect directly together we need to be able to actually face the challenges and move through them and find solutions we need to be able to become transparent which is what blockchain provides and BitCloud is providing is a, is a high level of transparency where we can actually begin to turn up and work together with this um, yeah, much more efficient kind of evolution. And off the byproduct of all of this, and, and by the way, what that means is just like when a butterfly, a caterpillar turns to a butterfly, the cells of the caterpillar, you know, the caterpillar goes into a cocoon and the cells begin to die, right? The cells begin to turn to mush. And out of the caterpillar, these, these things called imaginary cells begin to appear out of, its, out of its DNA, out of its cellular structures. And as those imaginary cells turn up, they are the cells that contain the blueprint of the butterfly. When they first appear in the cocoon with this, with this caterpillar, the caterpillar, the old cells, see those as a threat and try to destroy them. They try to shut the light down from those imaginary cells because they're so different that they feel like an, an imminent threat. And then because they're not aware, they don't have the vision of what's coming next. But eventually those imaginary cells multiply, multiply and take over because it's a more efficient cell that is designed to take the next phase. And the old cells get broken down and then absorbed into the structure and get rebuilt in a new structure to become a butterfly. And so that's where we are right now with BitCloud. BitCloud is the first of its kind. This decentralized social media platform, which is what we essentially see it as you know, right now, is the first that has made this kind of impact, that has had this kind of um, on, um, adoption already with these kinds of mechanisms, organisms. And it is creating evolution at a rapid pace. And as a byproduct, what it's doing is it's scaring the old cells out there, right? It's scaring the old centralized power, the old centralized thing. And when people come to it, we have to remember that, that it's daunting. It can be scary. And we need to just continue that conversation, continue the storytelling and help people find their way on organically as they're ready and help each other to be able to, you know, learn how you can now mine your own intrinsic value. So as a human, you are born with intrinsic value in this world. What that means is simply by being alive, your physical body, the energy that you have in your body, the work that you can do, the creativity in your mind, these things are all incredibly valuable. And so now we finally have a platform with BitCloud where we can begin to work together in supporting each other to mine our own intrinsic value. So instead of a, a workforce taking my value and selling it cheap and then me just getting a few bucks, I can now actually tap in and become proficient at mining my own value. And as I mine my own value, I'm able to then trade that. I can then you know, share that through very innovative ways and creative ways on BitCloud with each of you who are doing your own value. And what that means is we're taking the middleman out and we're being able to liberate the way we express ourselves because we can create a home for any of us, no matter what our beliefs, what our values are, we're all free to go create our own homes on BitCloud and we can all free to design and do it our own ways. And as we come together and attract each other and, and you know, really find our new communities in how we want to create this, we're going to see a much more organic flat hierarchy where we are driven by this greater vision for freeing human expression rather than just the greed of survival. And so that, my friends, is my, uh, well, it's morning over here for me, evening for you, little uh, rant on the beauty of BitCloud and how it's really supporting to liberate human expression because now creativity, the box is being busted wide open. You know, it is a time for experimentation and it is a time to learn how can we do this in a new way together. And just bear in mind as we go forwards, we're going to get it wrong lots of times. Anything about that comes to this evolution is going to face struggles. You know, we are going to experiment and try and get it wrong. And there's going to be other times we get it right. 
And I'm a big advocate for making sure we stay compassionate and understanding of all of those people that are daring to do something different, even if we don't like it. Because by doing those things, they get to be the ones that scout the way forwards and find out, is this going to work for our platform? And so I believe that we need to be able to experiment as long as we're listening to the repercussions of our experiment, we look at how it affects the community. We look at how it affects ourselves. You know, what the product is, was it an, ineff an efficient innovation or was it something that caused more distraction and problems and turbulence and didn't really offer value? And then as we listen to the repercussions of these things as a community, we're then able to innovate improve and constantly move towards creating a much more creatively efficient and conducive uh, platform on BitCloud. So with that all being said, thanks for tuning into that one and, and uh, listening to the rant. Are there any people, in, anyone here live that wants to put any contributions in or any questions or any comments about this topic or before we... Uh, begin to prepare for our next exciting session. Yeah, Mark, I'm sorry, but uh, I need to say that we just have like 10 minutes before the next session and we need to restart the stream. So maybe the question will, will be asked in a more uh, direct way. I uh, got you. Sorry, so, I, I thought Alex, we we're gonna go straight through the stream. That's cool, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I think it, it will be better to have two separate videos. So. We yeah, have 10 minutes absolutely. for it, so we can do this. So, and uh, I've pasted one link for you. Uh, check it in the chat. I think it can be a good uh, way to manage the further discussion with Hunter and Rush. So you can use it. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. All right, well, did you did you want to stop it there then? We can stop the stream and... and... Yeah, I'm stopping it now. Great. Thank you, brothers. Many thank yous. It was great. Hey. Cheers, Ryan. Oh, thanks, bro. <laughs> Did that play? Yeah. That's a bit loud, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if there will be some hard disputes, you can use it, you know, to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sopo. That was awesome. Thanks for being here, hey? All right, fantastic. Uh, you need hey, to stop Daniel. the 